Okay, it's Wednesday night, and it's time for all the excitement. And let me encourage those of you who are here to have some questions in mind. We're going to do a, a brief sort of bullet form history lesson as we get to tonight's topic, which is the fundamentals of the faith. What makes us Baptist? What's unique about us? Why do we meet here with ourselves rather than with other groups? I'm going to try to cover all that in a short amount of time tonight, but if you have a question, keep it and we'll field the question, then I'll repeat it for the live stream audience so we can all learn together. Some important prayer request. First of all, Brian Williams went through his dental surgery very well. He has a difficulty breathing when his mouth is closed because his nostrils close up from the chemical sensitivities. And they had, a, of course, a rubber covering over his mouth. So his fear was being able to breathe through the procedure. But he said he, he did just fine for, relatively speaking, for his life. So traumatized by chemical sensitivities. He did well. And then Jason Strom and Jay Miller are still doing well. Jay Miller had surgery uh, yesterday to remove the hematoma and the, um, uh, the, uh, the stop the remaining blood flow into his brain. Recovering very well. He's going home tonight, which was uh, ahead of schedule. So thank you for praying for him. Joyce Baxter is struggling in and out of the hospital now with some pretty um, acute attacks of blood pressure, high blood pressure. If you keep her in prayer. And then also, uh, uh, Amy Denny is mentioning to the um, Awana workers tonight that she is going to be leaving. They're, they're leaving Sarasota. The Denny family is moving to North Carolina. And this is a family who has served in Awana for as long as I can remember and has been the Awana director for decades. And, and they'll be leaving to go to North Carolina before, soon after the first of the year. So... If you'd be praying for the Denny family and for the children's ministry, the Awana ministry, some 45 or 50 kids over there every Wednesday night with Awanas. And then the Bible study that takes place here almost every day of the week with the children from TCA. She and some helpers do that. If that transition goes well, you can begin praying about that now. And about $46,000, a little more than that, came in for the Thanksgiving offering. So I want to thank each one of you who prayed about it and those who gave. We were able to make a donation of $5,000 to the Sarasota Medical Pregnancy Center because of the church's generosity. Let's have a word of prayer, then we're going to get into this topic, the fundamentals of the faith. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can pray tonight, that we are free to pray, and that you hear our prayers, and they are effectual. And for these people that we've been praying for for some time, Brian Williams with his long, um, drawn-out disorder of the chemical sensitivity that has just wreaked havoc in their lives, that you'll give him grace and strength, and we thank you for getting him through this procedure yesterday, and for Jason Strom and the heart valve surgery, and Jay Miller with um, the head surgery that he had to remove the uh, hematoma from his brain. Thank you for how well those things went, that uh, Joyce was able to get good treatment in the hospital herself, uh, for Alice Becht, who is struggling with the upcoming procedures for uh, breast cancer and what, what, what they're going to do there, that you'll give her peace as well. And then we pray for our Wanda ministry and the children's church and the Bible clubs here for TCA during the day, that you'll allow us to locate and implement the leadership to replace Amy Denny, that you'll bless Chuck and Amy and their children for their m many, many years of investment and the children's ministry of our church, that you'll bless them and that you'll use them in North Carolina as well. So we pray for tonight's discussion that it will be enlightening, that it will uh, stabilize and strengthen and broaden the basis of our faith, and that you will guide us in this discussion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> when I first became a believer, I became a believer in an independent fundamental Baptist church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it was, and Christianity was introduced to me in that sort of narrow view of Christianity. And in those days, the early 70s, those type of churches often gave the impression, although they wouldn't theologically present it or defend it that way, but in their lifestyle and their deportment, they gave the impression that anybody outside of that probably wasn't a Christian. And I've since learned through my years of uh, growth in the Christian faith and the Bible and ministry there are a lot more people who are true believers in Jesus Christ than just independent fundamental Baptists. 
And I've been blessed by that. I've been surprised by it. And now it's just a, an everyday fact. So when I think about the fundamentals of the faith, I'd like for us to identify what is it that makes us a brother or sister in Christ to other people. If they're not all Baptists, then if they're everything else, how do we know who to embrace? And, and one of the indicators, I think, would be, which I hope we never see, would be what happens when persecution sets in a country. They lop them all together. And any of those who will do not deny Christ become targets of persecution. Well, as we've heard from those who have been in prison because of their faith, the denominational labels are irrelevant when you're all being persecuted and tormented and tortured and the leadership is endeavoring to get you to recant your faith. You're all just brothers and sisters in Christ. Anybody who would endure the torment of persecution to refrain from denying Jesus would certainly be a, a worthy brother or sister in Christ, even if they differ in theological uh, positions. So where do those differences come from? So this is a real brief snapshot of history. But after the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, the, the head of the church, which was in Jerusalem, that's where people came to get their theological understanding. That's where they came to clarify ministries. That's where people were sent out from. Well, Jerusalem fell in 70 A.D., and the leadership of the church moved to Rome. And it grew further and further. But it didn't only just move from Rome. It moved from being Jewish to being predominantly Gentile. And in, the, in Rome, there was a division between Jews and Gentile believers because of that, the, the deep ties to Jewish heritage and then the complete um, ignorance of Jewish heritage to the Gentile believers who were rapidly outnumbering the Jews. Well, that made a change in the church where it became much more Gentile than it was Jewish. And then it began to incorporate aspects of pagan religions as as the years took place in Rome and more and more and more Gentiles joined in, they brought their old practices of the Roman faiths and the Roman religions and the Roman practices into the church. So the church became more and more Roman long before Constantine was converted. He was converted in 312 AD, or what he claimed as a conversion. There's certainly some debate about that. But when he became a professed Christian and made Christianity, the official religion of Rome, everything changed in the church. Now, from, from the point of Jerusalem's fall to Constantine becoming a Christian and making Christianity the official church of Rome, there were groups who never joined this collective because they were bothered by the compromises and the incorporation or the syncretism of pagan religions into Christianity. There were already groups that weren't part of this Roman church when Constantine declared it to be the official religion. So some of those groups are the groups to which Baptists attach their heritage. If you ever talk to a, a really rigid Baptist, they'll tell you Baptists are not Protestants. Um, although the world classifies us as that, Baptists don't associate with the Roman Catholic Church at all in their history, so they would say, no, we're not Protestant. We existed alongside the Roman Catholic Church all those centuries, although in very, very small numbers. So when Rome itself collapsed in 476 AD, the Roman Catholic Church broke into two groups, the Western and the Eastern. The Western is what we call Roman Catholicism. The Eastern is Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox. Those were both Roman Catholic churches under the same pope until Rome fell in 476, and then they divided. Well, they existed sort of equally and in, in some levels of friendship to about the 9th century when disharmony was um, inserted or evolved between the two groups. Then by the 11th century, the great schism took place, and they both considered themselves enemy, and one of them is... is uh, heretical, based upon who you're with. So that all happened long before the Reformation. Long before the Reformation was the Inquisition, in which the Catholic Church, both Spain and France predominantly, they persecuted groups of believers, and some of these names you might know, the Waldensians, the Albigenses, 
the Lollards, which were the followers of Wycliffe, the Anabaptists, which are the direct line of Mennonites and Brethren and Amish. But also the Anabaptists have a tie to Baptist today because the Anabaptist, the word means rebaptizer, they were the ones who said you have to be baptized as an adult. They rejected infant baptism and they rejected the sacerdotal practices of the Catholic Church. So we have some ties to Anabaptists except in the history of the Baptist Church, which they weren't called Baptists, they identify with the groups that pre-existed the Anabaptists. So when you read books about the history of Baptist faith, it goes back to the third or fourth, past the third century, uh, even before the Roman church was established. But they were all sort of lumped together by this time. Anabaptists, Lollards, uh, what comes to be known as particular Baptists after the Reformation, Albigenses, Waldensians, uh, Huguenots, which are the ones that were persecuted in St. Augustine, Florida. They all came into prominent being after the, Raf the Reformation, but they were being persecuted for centuries prior to that. So the Reformation takes place in 1517 when Martin Luther nails on the door of the Wittenberg Church the 95 Thesis. And Luther was not trying to pull away from the Catholic Church. He was trying to correct it. This was an endeavor to get them to come back to what he thought was their historic faith. Of course, the result was it started the Reformation, which was a reforming of the Catholic Church, but it resulted in groups breaking out. And they began to be called Protestants because they were protesting the Catholic Church. That's why Lutherans, Anglicans, um, Episcopalians, which is an American Anglican, and uh, Methodists, Presbyterians, all have vestiges of Catholicism in them because that's, that is their root history. Baptists don't because that's not our root history, although there's definitely a lot of similarities between it. So in addition to Lutherans, Anglicans, Episcopalians, Calvinists, which in France were called Huguenots, and in um, England, Puritans, Scotland, Presbyterians, or a particular Baptist in England. And then you have the Methodists who came up before America was founded. In addition to all that, all those Protestants, you have Reformed, you have Fundamentalist, you have Evangelicals, you have Pentecostals, you have Charismatic, and right now over 100 different Christian denominations in America alone. So how do we know who's who, and how do we know we can call somebody brother or sister in Christ, and how do we know where to fellowship? Uh, well, this might not answer the question, but this will give you some more confusing insight. The Reformation was launched with the five solas, and it's something that we all should be very familiar with, at least aware of, the five solas of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, which meant Scripture alone, is the authority for faith and practice. Sola Fide, which means faith alone, that you're saved by faith alone. Sola Gratia, which means by grace alone, that only by God's grace, not man's merit, are you saved through faith, and Scripture is the authority for that. Solus Christus, which means by Christ alone, by no other agent can we be saved. And soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. Those are the five solas of the Reformation. Those five solas flew directly into the face of the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church that had placed the authority of spiritual truth and scriptural truth under the umbrella of the church councils. So only church councils really established theology and doctrine. And if you think about that, that is why they were so opposed to the translation of Scripture. The, I, the concept of the Roman Catholic Church councils and the Eastern Orthodox, which would be Greek and Russian church councils, was that if we don't control what people believe, they will, they will fling off into heresy. And if everybody has their own Bible, everybody will be able to tailor make their own religion, which has some truth to it. We can see it in America today. Anybody who has a Bible can take a verse and create a doctrine out of it and become a famous television evangelist by using that to promote themselves. So you see the, the wisdom of their desire to have one set system of beliefs. The problem was they imposed it and they mandated it 
and often it was imposed upon people who never had a true conversion experience, that is in, in, a, um, in addition to the grave theological errors that crept in century after century to the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox. So these five solas, every um, modern-day Protestant or evangelical should be aware of what those are, and we owe a great deal to the men and women who encapsulated their faith in those five things and made that their calling card to identify so you would know what kind of a believer are you. Do you believe that by taking the juice and eating the bread and by saying a certain prayer or by uh, doing a certain sacrament that that saves you? Or do you believe it's through Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, by Christ alone, and all the glory goes to God? That became the earmark. The problem was when the Reformers came out, they had the same focus, that we've got to control this so that this new understanding or this accurate understanding, as they saw it, doesn't get diluted by people coming up with their own beliefs. So they took on some of the same practices as the Roman Catholic Church in terms of persecuting people who didn't believe how they believed, which is one reason why I firmly believe today the church should never have the power of the sword. The church should never be a governing body because human nature tends to demand other people agree. But that's how the Reformation was launched. But before the Reformation were well, these other groups, the Albigenses, the Waldensians, the Lollards, um, the Anabaptists, they existed um, in record, at least by the year 1000. So they predate the Reformation by 500 years. But once the Reformation happens, they're all lumped in together as Protestants, and the established church aggressively tried to silence them, which is why the Puritans, predominantly, came to the United States to, for freedom of worship, and why they considered the freedom of worship to be critical to a society to worship the way you feel compelled by your own conscience. So America was sort of founded by Calvinists, by Reformed uh, Puritan mindset. The great revivals leading up to the American Revolution were led by Calvinists, by Reformed people, by Congregationalists, by those who believed that God made a decree and God saves you by grace and faith alone, but you've got to repent and get right with him because he's a judgeful, judgmental, not judgmental, a rightfully judging God. Well, that had a great birth to the country. We had issues with racism and other things and total disregard for the indigenous people. But after a while, vibrant Christianity began to um, dissolve into modernism and what they called textual criticism, which was liberalism, denying the authority of Scripture, denying the need for salvation, denying the reality of heaven, the, rea well, the reality of hell, and removing the substitutionary death of Christ. So in the late 20s and 30s, the five fundamentals were established, predominantly by American believers. What are the fundamentals of the faith that a true believer has to believe? And these are what those are. We know what the five solas are. The five fundamentals tend to mark fundamental Christian uh, growth in the 30s all the way through the 70s. Number one, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these five fundamentals were a statement to say you must believe these five things to be a true Bible-based believer. Number two was the virgin birth of Christ, which had been discounted by liberalism. Number three, the blood atonement, that we are saved by the shedding of the blood of Christ. Number four, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and then some added on to it the bodily return. So it's the deity of Christ that he's God, not a form of God and not a, a manifestation of God and not a sub-creature of God. He's God himself. Number two, he was born of a virgin. Number three, the shedding of his blood is the atonement for man's sin. His body literally physically arose from the dead, and his body will literally and physically return. And the number five is the inspiration of Scripture. Now, all those things became important because Christianity was veering off rapidly into a social organization in which it was all about doing good deeds and there was no 
um, preaching of the gospel and confession of sin and repentance before God and trusting in Christ, it was becoming a massive good deed organization and it was affecting every denomination. All those denominations that had been fed into by the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening had now drifted off into liberalism. So the Five Fundamentals was an attempt to remedy that and to let a group of people know, here's what we are. Well, in those fundamentals, it tended to be a lot of those were Baptist. So Baptist and fundamentalism got heavily associated for decades. And it was even that way until the 70s when I was at Liberty University and Jerry Fall was, was a fundamentalist and the Liberty University was considered a fundamentalist school and all the churches I went to were considered fundamentalist. But then the Ayatollah Khomeini, um, Khomeini took the hostages in Iran. And in the newspapers every day while I was in college, it was fundamentalist, fundamentalism. And they didn't say Islamic or Muslim. It was just fundamentalism. And this radical um, hostage-taking, uh, woman-hating, uh, violent religion was simply called fundamentalism. So they began to discuss among the Christian leaders of the day who were fundamentalists that maybe we can't use this term anymore because it no longer means what we thought it, what we meant it to mean. We coined it to mean the fundamentals of the faith, but now fundamentalism has come to mean very strict, rigid, unloving, unkind legalism and hatred of others. So they began to embrace the, uh, the word that they had rejected until then of evangelical. We all now call ourselves evangelicals, but that wasn't true in the early 70s. Fundamentalists did not like the word evangelical because it meant compromiser. And it meant you don't really have any rigid faith. But English language changes. And so we all embrace that evangelical title. And there'll be changes coming in the next 50 years. Who knows what we will be called. But if you add to those five fundamentals, here are some things that are 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 sort of critical to what it means to be a Baptist. Number one, believing in the Trinity. There are people who believe in Jesus Christ but who do not believe in the Trinity. They are modalists and they believe God appears in modes. So sometimes He's God the Father, sometimes He's God the Spirit, sometimes He's God the Son. So they might say Jesus is God but they don't see Him as being part of a triune. Well part of Baptist faith is the Trinity and that's probably true of most fundamental faith and Protestant faiths is a belief in the Trinity, but certainly among Baptists. But critical to a Baptist practice of faith is baptism by immersion after one can voice their faith. So being sprinkled as an infant doesn't do anybody any harm. It's not um, satanic. It's not cult-like. It doesn't do any damage. I was sprinkled by my grandfather who was ordained a Methodist, and as I've told you the story before, because he was divorced before he uh, became a believer, and he was a, a Native American, full blood. When he got saved, he um, felt like God called him to preach. He got saved in a Baptist church, and he told his Baptist pastor, and the Baptist pastor said, God doesn't call divorced people. But he felt like, I know God called me to preach. So he walked across. In Oklahoma in those days, there was a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church you know, in, the, in the town. He walked across the street to the Methodist church and said, God has called me to preach. And they put him in school, trained him, and he started 42 old-style gospel preaching Methodist churches. Because of that, when I was born, he christened me. But my dad was a Christian scientist. We were a Christian scientist family. Uh, that christening didn't do any damage to me. It didn't send me on a terrible course. There's nothing wrong with christening. But theologically speaking and doctrinally speaking, we believe the New Testament teaches baptism is an outward expression of somebody's faith who can articulate it. So you get saved, you get baptized after you're saved as a testimony of your faith. In very good uh, Christian traditions, and say Presbyterian, Methodist, and Lutheran, they baptize infants as a projection that this child will be a believer because their parents are believers and we're dedicating them to that purpose, which is why we in our church, we do baby dedications, hoping that the day will come when that child will make their profession of faith and then be baptized. That is unique to, particularly to Baptists who baptize by immersion, 
down into the water, not by sprinkling. So not only is adult baptism one of our distinctives, it's baptism by immersion, which I hope you'll see more of in 2021. The third thing is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That is what we teach as Baptists, that it's not a second act of salvation, that you get saved and then later on you get the Holy Spirit. We believe the Spirit indwells you at the very moment of salvation, the priesthood of the believer, that every one of us can go straight to God. You don't need to have somebody intercede for you. Every one of us can go to the intercessor himself, Jesus Christ. And this comes straight from predating the Reformation. Those groups believed you don't have to go to a priest to have your sins absolved. You don't have to confess to a priest. You don't have to do Hail Marys and Our Fathers and an act of penance to get forgiveness. You can go directly to the intercessor himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask to be restored into fellowship. That's the priesthood of the believer. Not that we sacrifice, but that each one of us have the same authority as the pastor in the pulpit does, to go directly to God. That is one of the unique things about Baptist faith. And then eternal security. Now, there are, nowadays there are many Baptist sects who don't preach eternal security, but it is part of our heritage. Not only are we Calvinistic in our origins, we also believe in eternal security. Since God did it, uh, not us, we can't lose it. And the next would be the sovereignty of God. However he might exercise it, to what extent he might control things is always under debate. But we all Baptists tend to believe, or Bible-believing Baptists, in the sovereignty of God, that he's in control of all things. And he moves in the hearts of men and women to do as he wants them to do, even sometimes without them realizing it. And then one of the hallmarks of Baptist faith, which you've seen exercised here many times, is local church autonomy. That every church is in and of itself a local church, not controlled by an outside organization. So even Southern Baptists who have a denomination, each one of those Southern Baptist churches is a local autonomous group that makes its own decisions about where it goes. Now if they're involved in a denomination, sometimes the denomination will assist them in finding them a new pastor, but the local church makes their own decisions. That is one of the things unique to Baptist theology, that there is no hierarchy. There are no bishops. There are no cardinals. There's nobody telling Faith Baptist Church what to do because it is congregationally governed, led by a pastor or led by elders, uh, deacons, uh, spiritual leadership. But the church makes the decisions. It's, a, it's a, a democratic structure that goes way back, predates the United States, goes way back even before the Reformation, of the churches that believed every single local church, the people in it, determine how they're going to function. So I say all that to say this. That is what we are. Our primary calling card is holding forth the word of life, which is the word of God. We want to preach it correctly. We want to teach it correctly. We want to understand it and apply it correctly so that we can hand it off to the next generation. That does not mean that all those who don't believe as we are aren't our brothers and sisters in Christ. There are many believers, and um, some of them have written some of the most um, deep devotional books of great faith who are Episcopalian, who are Anglican, who believe in christening, who don't believe in baptism by immersion. That doesn't mean they're not Christians. They're, it simply means they're not Baptist. Our family of faith extends well beyond our particular even type of Baptist. From the last count I heard, there are 60-something different type of Baptists. So, you know, if, if it's just going to be our type, that's, be, that's a very small family of God. It goes beyond that. And I think it might even cross over into some do denominational groups that would surprise you because God looks at every individual's heart. Let's say you were raised in a family, in a community, in, a, in an area where there was only one particular church. Let's say it's Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, not Baptist at all. And you came to know Christ. And you believe in Jesus. You believe in the Bible. You know you've been saved and you're living out your faith. But you've never even heard of Baptist practices. Would that mean that you're not a believer because you're not a Baptist? That, that Certainly that can't be the case. Uh, it's an individual response, which is another distinctive of Baptist faith, that 
every individual. It's not, it's not group salvation. It's not national salvation. It's not church-wide salvation. Every individual must respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which sometimes drifts us off into decisionism a lot and easy choices to say this prayer and you're saved. And that's not salvation either. Salvation is a profound awakening of the Spirit by the Spirit of God to which you confess Jesus as Lord and it changes you and you no longer are the same person. You have the same personality and maybe the same um, proclivities, but you have a new ingredient. You have an enlivened spirit that was dead before. So it makes you a brand new person in Christ. So that's my quick presentation because we've been talking about false teachers. False teachers aren't those who don't necessarily teach these things that we went at last. But anybody who would deny the fundamentals of the faith, anybody who would deny the five solas, which would certainly be more in church practice than some, um, and deny the, the indwelling of the Spirit, you know, we, we, we would have trouble fellowshipping with. But if the United States ever turns against the church, it's going to turn against all of us together. And I found this out when I was in jail for my pro-life exercises in Buffalo. How few Baptists were in there, first of all. There were very few Baptists in jail, but a lot of Catholics, a lot of Charismatics, and it was my first exposure in intimate ways with Catholic believers and Charismatic believers and spending days in jail and doing exercises with them to help save babies. I learned that, man, Christianity is a lot bigger than I thought because I could see genuine faith in these people who were committed in some ways more so to that cause than my Baptist friends and pastors were who didn't see any relevance to abortion as being a critical spiritual issue that was destroying the heart of America. They didn't want to touch it because it was political. And that's a, phil a philosophy, but I was always surprised by the indifference. How could a believer be indifferent to the slaughter of babies? I couldn't comprehend that. But I could see the, the openness among people who weren't Baptist to the point that I even preached in a Catholic church once. I was at an event where one of the people helping us was a Monsignor. He wore a cowboy hat and cowboy boots and his Catholic um, clergy collar. For some reason, he took a liking to me. And I preached at something, and he said, Would you come preach at my church? I said, well, as long as I can preach the gospel. He said, well, what else would you preach? I said, well, then I'll come. And he let me come preach. They had a big banquet, some 800 people. And right over here was a statue of Mary and something else, another saint over there. I forget who. And they had me preach. And so I gave the gospel as clear and distinct as I could. And all through it, that Monsignor would take off his hat and wave it and say, Amen. He would say an amen and a hallelujah while I'm saying, and I even said it once, I pointed at the statue and said, Mary can't save us, only Jesus Christ can save us. And he kicked this cowboy boot up in the air. He goes, amen. Well, I never in a million years would have thought a Roman Catholic would in any way be somebody I'd want to do some kind of ministry with. But that exposure opened my eyes so when Jesus is in somebody, there's just a difference to them. Even if their training is different, if their background is different, they are a brother in Christ that the Spirit of God has made them alive, even with our theological differences. So although we try to be firm and strong in what we preach and teach, we never want to exclude other people who don't necessarily see it the way that we do or the way that I teach, because some of you might not see it the way I do either. But the way that I teach, we want to be loving, we want to be authoritative as the Bible allows us to be, um, but welcome and pray for other Christians around the world. I would guess, knowing church history and the groups that are, that are from which we derive, very few of them would probably even identify with us. They would see our commitment as being very shallow. They wouldn't recognize American Christianity. They would think we've been sort of wishy-washy, that we're not very engaged, that we're very distracted by materialism. I don't know if the Albigenses and the Lollards and the Waldensians, these people who were hunted down and killed just for having copies of the Bible, pages in their hand, and who would be willing to die for it, if they were here today and realized that 
most of our church won't come because of COVID. And that if, the, if there's a boating opportunity or this opportunity, that opportunity, we'll skip church the drop of a hat while they're dying just to meet together in a home. I don't know if they'd even consider us Christians. But we are, but their perspective was so different. So we don't, we, if, if we want them to accept us and say, yes, you're our descendants, you're true believers, we should be willing to embrace others who are not ashamed to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I believe he saved me and saved me by faith, regardless of what the denominational label might be. All right, that's an awful lot in a few minutes. Anybody have any questions that you're dying to ask that you want me to repeat to the live stream audience? Yes. Uh, the question asked was about the King James, that in the 60s and 70s and the 50s, as the independent Baptist church movement began to grow, and in the early 70s, the 10 fastest growing churches in America were independent fundamental Baptist churches. They all tend to hold to the idea that the King James version of the Bible is the only Bible to be used in church. It's the way this church was founded. This church was founded as a King James only church. <clears throat> um, but as education came in to the preachers who were getting saved and, and going to Bible college and got exposed to Greek and Hebrew, it became readily apparent that the King James Bible was simply a translation of the Greek and the Hebrew. So did God inspire the King James translators, which some, some people do believe, or did God inspire the original manuscripts? And as people went off to seminary and studied uh, linguistics and Hebrew and Greek, they began to think, well, if the King James is only a translation, maybe other translations are just as valid. And that opened up the possibility. Uh, the King James has outdated English in it. It's a fine translation. The New King James uses the same manuscripts as the King James, but modernizes the English because, as we've just heard, fundamentalism doesn't mean the same thing anymore. Gay doesn't mean the same thing anymore. And there's other words. So the New King James and the other versions, ESV and others, they update the language. But the difference in the New King James and some of the other ones, the ESV, the NIV, the RSV, is the manuscripts they've chosen to use as the basis for what they translate. And that's a more complex story. But I preach from the New King James, but it's primarily for preference out of familiarity with the King James. I, I grew up on it. I memorized in the King James. That's all I ever read until about... 25 years ago. So I memorized that I'm familiar with the language. The New King James was an easier change for me and the fact that it uses the Textus Receptus as its source and not um, Aleph and Beta as the um, sources. That's why I read for the New King James. But the other ones, the books they do translate, they translate very well. My problem with them is they leave out sections that they don't find in the oldest manuscripts. That's what I'm uncomfortable with there. But it doesn't seem to be a, an earmark anymore of independent Bible preaching Baptist churches. But there are still, there's still a group of fundamental Baptists who still hold to King James only. And they will also tend to not be for soundtracks in church and, and uh, women wearing pants and that kind of stuff. It tends to sort of go along with that. Um, but the King James Bible is still a great translation of the Bible. It changed the world. That's the Bible God used in a lot of ways. But... Um, English language evolves. It changes, and our translations are translations. All right, before we get ourselves into trouble, let's stop there. It's 10 after 7. We'll have a word of prayer, and we can, uh, we can head out for the night. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Word of God that we can rely on, we can depend on, we can preach with boldness, we can anchor our faith in it. We thank you for the men and women throughout history who have stood strong for the faith, who had the courage to stand up against governmental authorities and even church authority to hold up the authority of Scripture and, and faith and grace and salvation by God alone and the need for individual believers to respond and 
the inability of the church to cast people out or bring people in, that it is your spirit that does that. We thank you for these people who are willing to die to give us a copy of the Scripture. We look to those people and their faith, and we marvel at what they did without any political clout, without any armies, without any protection. They stayed true to you under tremendous persecution by people who called themselves Christians. We ask you to help us to emulate that kind of faith, that we're committed to your word, that we love one another, and that we'll stand strong when times get rough. For we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. I hope you have a great night. On Sunday, the next four Sundays, it's all going to be Christmas-themed. The Ditchfield family is going to sing the next two Sundays in our services some Christmas songs and worship. And then on the 20th, our praise team will present our Christmas program. But any Sunday you bring a guest with you in the month of December, it's going to be the, the gospel in Christmas. And keep that in prayer and look for somebody you can bring with you. Have a great night.